Welcome to episode one of this little mini series on Engage to Educate, where I share a whole mountain of practical tools to help take the heavy lifting off of you to increase connection engagement in your own context. The inspiration for this series actually came from working with one of my absolute favorite clients, uh, WSU Tech, Wichita State University Tech School in Wichita, Kansas, where I partner with them over the course of six separate workshops and trainings with all of their faculty to help take the heavy lifting off of them to make connection and engagement really easy. So the first session, we unpacked the five ingredients for engagement, which is what we're gonna do in this video. The following five sessions, we picked apart just one ingredient and came up with tons of examples and different methods and ways that they can weave that ingredient into their own courses. I'm gonna share with you the same exact methods and tools and exercises that I use with faculty and educators from all around the world to help make connection and engagement really easy. I'm Chad Littlefield and I am so pumped to be your guide as you unpack this entire suite of tools that will make you a deeply impactful leader. Let's get into it. <music> So a little series roadmap. So we're in episode one right now. I'm gonna overview the first session that I did with faculty. And I'm gonna share how I actually introduced experientially, over the course of 90 minutes, experientially introduced the five ingredients for engagement. It does not matter whether you are in a totally remote environment, if you're an in-person environment, or if you're in this weird hybrid blended adaptation. In fact, from this moment forward, I would love for you to ruthlessly steal and reinterpret every single thing that I say and do and apply to your own context. So I'm gonna share the exact ways and actually go through my workshop flow. So I'm gonna be looking at what I actually did with faculty and saying I did this and I did this and then we did this. So you actually get a preview of my outlines for how these workshops actually ran, but they're my outlines. By the end of this series, I would love for you to have your outlines. I'd love for you to have your, the things that you want to take away and steal and adapt into your own context. Get a notepad ready. The first thing I did at 10.56 a.m., four minutes before the official start time for this workshop series was, I held up this question to my camera. All these series took place over Zoom and I asked the group right away, as soon as they logged on, they didn't know what to expect, we hadn't met at all, and I said, before I share anything that I know with you, what is something that you know really well? And the chat got filled with all sorts of stuff. Now this is a technical college, so these are people who are building airplane engines and they're teaching people to be nurses and so all sorts of stuff is flowing through the chat about uh, what they know related to work but also related to hobbies. Really lovely to see what people are really good at. It's also a really a solid foundation to start off. So thinking about how do you command respect from students don't start by talking about how awesome and cool you are. Ask them what they know really well. Focus on them. Once there were about 80 to 90 responses in the chat, I invited them to go back to the chat and scroll through and find a faculty member that they know, they recognize their name, they've worked with them in the past, but find a faculty member who shared something that they didn't know. So before the official start of the workshops, now we're at about 10.59 a.m., and all faculty have learned something about one of their peers that they hadn't already known before. The second thing I did, now we're at the official start time. It's 11 a.m. and I hold up my calculator on my phone to the group and I say, okay, I would love to do a little collaborative calculator exercise. Using your number pad in the chat, can you type the number of years of experience that you have teaching whatever it is or doing whatever it is you do? Because a lot of um, instructors at WSU Tech may have been in industry welding steel for 30 years, semi-retired and decided they wanted to teach. And so you've got people with this brilliant library of life experience that they're now passing on to students. So all these numbers start going through the chat. 10, 20, 30, two, five, six, seven, right? And then I asked the group, all right, I wanna do a little collaborative calculation. You are all brilliant. In fact, my perspective coming in here is that you collectively are much smarter than I am individually. So uh, if you were to just gauge, like what's the, the rough average of the amount of years of experience this group has? And saw those averages come through and then I took kind of an average of the average. So what I estimated was that there was roughly 10 years on average of experience in this group for every person. And there were 92 faculty on the call. 
92 times 10 is 920 years of life experience. So who am I as the instructor to come in and say, I know everything. Hello, sponges. I can't wait to be your sage on the stage. It's like, that's a really good way to not command respect from a group of students. And so I really acknowledge that really clearly that you have 920 years of experience. And so what I did with you early, earlier, where I rang the bell, I said that exact phrase. From this moment forward, I invite you to ruthlessly steal and reinterpret anything that I say and do and apply it to your own context. You can imagine that faculty who have been doing this for 30 years and we're like, all right, another faculty development. And on top of this, it's happening on a Friday. Like, okay, if it's mandatory, I guess I have to attend. But my goal, and I believe that the goal of really great educators is to transform that attendance into attention. And so I think at this point, in fact, I know at this point because I can see a bunch of faces on Zoom that were like, oh gosh, Friday, what are these sessions gonna be like? Oh my gosh, I have six more of these. And then all of a sudden their faces turned into like leaning in and ready in the chat. They were ready and primed to engage. And it was only 11.02 a.m. Everything I just described to you, I would put under the category of unofficial start. It's ingredient number one. It's what episode two of this mini series will dive deeply into. It's the idea of rewarding people for showing up early by starting with immediate and purposeful engagement rather than rewarding people for being late by waiting for them. So start a few minutes before and run that unofficial start a few minutes after. In episode two, we'll unpack a ton of concrete examples of what the unofficial start looks like. The second ingredient that I share is this idea of a context hook. So even though they all clicked the same Zoom link, we were not in the same context. It was a different temperature where they were, literally different weather in Wichita than it was in Pittsburgh, totally different context. They also had a different morning than I had. They're in a different state of mind. And so you've got to do and or say something to bring everybody into the same context. The easiest way to frame a context hook is to get really, really crystal clear about your intention for their time and attention and state that really clearly to them. And so I had a few. And so my intention was, and I share this at the beginning of every single session that I had with them, and I repeated it, because I think the context hook is really important. And you've heard me say it twice in this video already. My intention is to take the heavy lifting off of you to create a really connected and engaged learning environment to increase your impact and student outcomes. And, and this, this piece is very important, and, I wanna do that in a way that leaves you with absolutely nothing to do once you leave this meeting. In fact, I had a mentor once, and I told the group that I had a mentor once that invited me or challenged me to never leave a meeting with something to do, which is pretty hard. Most people, like most meetings, create heaps of work. Um, but it's a really cool challenge to take on. And I'll tell you what, that loop people in the context. They were like, ooh, this always, like, we're not getting homework? Right? We're gonna do, we're, we don't have to leave. We, all we have to do is attend and be present. There's an attraction to that because I had 92 faculty who had too much to do in too little time. Second context hook. I held up this number and I said, this, my friends, is the number of PowerPoint slides that I'll be using across all of our workshops. And in that moment, in Zoom gallery view, I saw a bunch of this. What? <laughs> How are you gonna teach us? Where's the content gonna come from? Instead of, PowerPoint slides, I'd love to invite you to wear two hats. And the first hat, and I showed them this picture. The first hat, I'm inviting you to put on my son Otto's hat. So Otto has an ability. In fact, this picture was taken three seconds after I held up this to Otto. I asked them to unmute and guess, what is this? It's like, a potato? Pla yes, a very particular type of potato. This is a plastic potato. I held this up to Otto, and this was his face. If I held up this plastic potato with no context, if we started the session, my unofficial start was hold up plastic potato. At best, I'm gonna get some very confused looks, but most likely there's gonna be a surge of disappointment. And yet there's something in Otto's brain that's active that made him light up. And so inviting you to uh, wear his hat and just be voraciously curious. Otto has the gift of loving learning about anything, whether it's a plastic potato or a first time in a swimming pool or learning about calculus or review of algebra or how to build a plane engine and then rattle off a handful of examples of their courses and lessons. The second hat that I invited folks to wear was using the zoom filter, this digital pirate hat. And I asked the group to come off me. This was a little bit of a risk in a group of wild uh, faculty. I asked them to unmute and uh, just start calling out, yelling out skills that pirates had. 
Zoom audio compression has gotten really good. And so you can have 90 people popcorning things out and it doesn't sound too bad actually. And so I'm inviting them to popcorn out sword fighting, drinking, they you know, shared a bunch of skills that their bunch of faculty were very happy to laugh at. And of course somebody said stealing and pillaging. And I said, awesome. I don't care if you're good at sword fighting. If you are, great. But what I would love for you to do is put on a pirate hat and from this moment forward be really good at stealing ruthlessly everything that I say and do and apply it to your own context. So that's the, the place where I invited them to ruthlessly steal and reinterpret and apply to their own context. So with those two hats and that context hook, we were ready to get into some connection before content, which is the third ingredient for engagement. Peter Block, who kind of coined this phrase, connection before content, uh, once said, without relatedness, no work can occur. I've experienced that to be uh, quite true, and yet really good connection before content also connects to the purpose of why you're there. And so I held up a question that was actually a fill in the blank question. It, was, it just said, what is one of the best examples of blank? And I said, high engagement in your class. So I wanted to get people into conversations and acknowledge that, uh, yeah, I'm coming in to help make engagement really easy for you and to take the heavy lifting off, but you've been doing this for 10 plus years. And so you've probably figured out some strategies. So jump into groups, meet each other, find out uh, your context, and share one of the best examples so that you come back from breakouts a little bit smarter, a little bit wiser with three to five other ahas or nuances or tips or tactics to create really high engagement from your peers, not just from Mr. Sage on the stage. Then when we came back from breakouts, I believe that uh, you've got to always do something to take all those individual clicks and form them into one community. So I use the popcorn method to invite the group to just popcorn out responses to the question, what struck you about those conversations or what did you notice about those conversations? And so you have the group sharing things like, ooh, it was really uh, insightful. Like I heard something that I hadn't thought about before or to be honest, I felt reaffirmed or, it, or not related to the content. It was actually just, it was really nice to talk with faculty, right? I'm always with my aviation people or I'm always with my nursing people or I'm always with my gen ed people. And so it was really nice to just actually take a pause from that and connect with other people who think a little bit differently than I do. And this is really important. After they had the experience of connection before content, I then shared the data uh, that Google found from their giant research study uh, that they called Project Aristotle, where they went on a quest to find the characteristics of the highest performing teams at Google. And they found that the number one characteristic of high performing teams at Google was the degree of psychological safety in that group. It wasn't the perfect Myers-Briggs. It wasn't the uh, most technically experienced team. It wasn't even the years of experience. It was the degree of psychological safety, which is PhD academic Harvard uh, language for can I be myself at work? Can I share ideas and trust that even if someone disagrees that we'll uplift and work on them and have task conflict, but not relationship um, gossip. And that's really important uh, for me to share that data after they've had an experience because the people that are thinking uh, really rationally, logically, they're data minded, they're like, okay, yeah, 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 connection before content. Give me the research, right? Give me the pedagogy behind this. Um, sharing bits and little statistic stats throughout are really useful and important to recapture and reset the attention of somebody who tends to be a little bit more left-brained. The unofficial start, all the experiences that we had just done, the conversations, uh, totally activated people who tend to relate to stories and experiences and emotions and feelings. So we wanted to get some data in there. Fourth ingredient for engagement is actually content. If you are teaching anything or you're running a meeting and the content isn't valuable enough for someone to tune into, it's gonna be impossible to engage them. I can't teach you enough tips, tactics, strategies, etc to be able to overcome someone's complete lack of interest or connection to the purpose of why they're actually there. And so you've gotta have really good content. My trick is that I wanna design content for contribution, not consumption. Because when I design contribution for consumption, I am competing with the likes of Netflix and Hulu, Amazon Prime and YouTube. And I do not wanna do that because they've got much bigger budgets than you do as an educator. And so you don't wanna compete in the consumption market, rather, you wanna design experiences that are created for contribution, not consumption. And we unpacked a little bit and an observation I've noticed in every single class or group that I've ever worked with, there's always critics, consumers, and contributors. 
And on the outlying poles, there's uh, curmudgeons, the people that are just in a perpetual state of crankiness that nothing you say or do will ever change their mind. They're just there. And then you've got connectors who are like your top students who are all showing up afterward. And even they're the ones raising their hands, connecting ideas to ideas, saying, ooh, what we learned in week one totally ties into week two. They're the students that make being an educator such a rewarding, phenomenal career and experience. And so I unpacked, drew out this whole graph on the iPad for them, sharing all of uh, this data and observations. And then I needed to get like a pressure release valve for them to be able to react to that. And so I split them back into a, a second breakout with the simple prompt of react. And more specifically, I said, share how this uh, either relates or does not relate to your experience as an educator. Lovely breakout discussions. That pressure relief valve is really important, especially if you've successfully turned on people's brains and they are engaged and present. You've gotta give them that time to be able to speak. It's one thing to just be hearing what somebody else is saying. It's another to be able to learn by articulating out your response to what you're hearing. And so when we came back, I wanted to create space for introverts to be able to do that too. So I led a collaborative journaling exercise where I invited the group to actually teach what they've learned so far in our time together in the chat. So through writing. So I played a song that was about two minutes for them to journal on and write down um, something that they've learned, a, a takeaway that they've had from those conversations or from the time that we've spent already. And uh, type it, but don't press enter. And then at the end of that song, everybody hit enter, which in 92 people writing roughly 150 words, that's like half a book right there of takeaway tips and ideas from your peers. And the group loved this because then I played another two to three minute song and invited the group to scroll through the chat and be a pirate. Steal all the other brilliance that's in the chat. And what I love so much about that is it serves as a review of our session, but it's put forward as their brilliance and not just what I'm teaching them necessarily. It's their spin, it's their framing. And so you always learn more when you teach something than you do when you're just learning it. And so this collaborative journaling exercise this got kind of blended with this concept of tiny teach or teach a little teeny snippet of something is a really great way to embed a learning and also give that learning in the form of a review to everybody else. Because at this point, we're starting to wrap up to the fifth ingredient, which is closing. And I met a woman one time at an event that was about half my height, all white hair, and introduced herself to me as a professional storyteller. Ooh, that's interesting. Tell me more. What's one of your number one tips for telling really phenomenal stories? And she did not even blink before she responded and said, I got it. All you need to know is the first sentence that you're gonna say and the last sentence that you're gonna say. You can kind of fill in the middle. And I think as an educator, knowing the first thing you're gonna do, that unofficial start, and then knowing the experience that you're gonna actually close with that invites contribution, is such a powerful tool to set your students up to want to come back. So many classes end with a fizzle or the sound of zippering backpacks because they're like, okay, yeah, I can kind of see we're kind of trailing off here, time's running out. What if every class ended with some peak experience that left the group on a high saying, ooh, that was really fun. Like, I can't believe that time went by so quickly. That's the kind of learning experiences that I wanna create as an educator. So the experience that I led with the group was called Group Anthem. Really simply, I was inviting them to make closing statements that began with only one of these three prompts. Either I am, I believe, or I will. I am, I believe, or I will. I gave them about 30 seconds to think about what their closing statement uh, was. I invited everybody to switch up in a speaker view so that whoever spoke showed up big to kind of create this intimacy of one person talking as opposed to some anonymous box in Zoom. And uh, I put myself on mute and I said, go for it. All you have to do is come up to the mic, come off mute and just share your closing statement. It could be about something you're wrestling with, something you're excited to take away, uh, something, a light bulb that went off for you, anything that you wanna choose to take away or leave this group with, go for it. And so what better way to end episode one in this first video, but with the words of faculty from this session. Just sharing audio files for their anonymity's sake, but here they are. I'll start. I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only one dealing with promotions. I believe in the power of the culture of connection. I will work yeah. hard to be a better educator. I believe in what I'm doing and I'm not going to let any curmudgeon stop from the rest of the class getting what they need. I believe in my students. I believe the little field attitude could be contagious. I am excited to get through the rest of the five and learn more. Wow. You see the energy of hearing all of those statements, all of those different voices, as opposed to me saying, see you next week, class. See you on Tuesday. 
Wait, 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 don't forget about the tab. Ending with logistics. Never end with logistics. Always make logistics the, at least the second to last thing that you do. End with some deliberate closing. And in episode six of this mini series, I'll give you a bunch of examples of different closing exercises that you can end on a really wonderful high note. This was really fun. I can't wait for more. See you in episode two, where we're gonna do a deep dive into unofficial starts.